Am I a co-host? Yeah. <laughs> Let everyone in. Am I a co-host? Is that happening? I did. I made okay, you right. a co-host. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thursday night art fair. My name is Carolina Weed. I'm a curator at art fair. Uh, among other things, and tonight at 6 p.m. on our artist conversations and uh, studio visits and talks, I have the one and only Molly McKinley. Welcome. Thank you, Caroline. It's so nice to be here and talk to you today. Absolutely. Um, I know I was ripping and running today, so like I got um, my my uh, installing best, but yeah. nonetheless, uh, you look divine, and Thank most you. importantly, the work behind you. You're in your studio. I am. Yeah, thank you. I'm here in Alfred, New York. I've also been working today. I've been like in the glass studio today. So I'm on the tail end of that energy also. So we're like in work mode. We love that. <laughs> in work mode, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. I know. Um, yeah, you know, it wouldn't it have been just dreamy to get some shots of you. You were kind of mentioning before like getting your hands dirty, rolling up your sleeves and being in the glass. Uh, you know, get the fire going and, and really get some uh, tough job kind of shots while oh, you're yeah. in, in It's so seductive. I mean, I'm, I also will like say that I'm not a glass blower. Like I work with glass blowers and I'm basically like learning how to be like an assistant so that I can be really deep into the material process. Like it's very easy, of course, to like, you can hire anyone to make anything in a material for you. But like, I really want to understand like, the possibilities and limitations of a material so that the creative process isn't really being taken over by someone that I'm working with that is really the master of that material. Um, mm -hmm. So it's more collaborative, which I think is important for me. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's still like, it's still juicy. And like, it's, yeah, there's a, there's an energy that's really not easily translatable to even language, I think that happens because it is so elemental. And there's these moments of like, real intense adrenaline and like you know you're trying to avoid all these dangerous situations too so there's so much of this like dance and choreography that's happening in the hot shop and the kind of work that I do requires a number of people to be working on a team so it is this really nice kind of group energy of like hyper focus but also it's really hot like really really hot you're working with like a, a furnace that's 2,000 degrees you know like things that are like so deeply um immediate so you like you're not distracted by anything else you're trying not to burn yourself or others or drop anything and right. ruin your artworks um but yeah it, one day we'll we'll do like the the tour <laughs> that, that would be really and quite literally hot yeah yeah <laughs> I'll burn the camera uh well you know glass blowing is really such or glass work is such uh, a specific thing and i know that they're are a lot of colleges out there or schools out there in higher education that just don't touch it. I mean, because of viability issues and a lot of dangerous things, but there are a few places in New York and very few, you can count them in your hand. And, um, and certainly there are a few places in higher educational institutions where you can learn glass blowing. but how did you get into it? Yeah, I mean, basically I got into glass about five years ago and I really came in through the idea of casting. So I was trying to find ways to cast my salt sculptures in different materials. And so kind of in my mind, I was thinking like, oh, should I like make these in metal? And metal just felt like it didn't match the translucence. There's this kind of semi-opaque quality to the salt and like sunlight really glows through it. Um, so I felt like I'd be doing a disservice to that material of the salt to try to make these castings in either metal or ceramics. And my partner, Noah, actually is a former glassmaker. So I was with him in the hot shop one day and he was like pulling these stringers, which are just like long, thin strings is exactly what it sounds like. Um, and I was like, oh, obviously it has to be glass. So I started taking these like classes at Urban Glass, which is an amazing place for anyone who's interested in learning about glass. It's in Brooklyn. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous facility with like so many talented teachers and artists that come through there all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But I just like got a couple scholarships to like learn some glass casting there. And then from that project that I like showed some of that work at Pioneer Works in my solo show in 2017, which is called mm -hmm. Salt Priestess and um, ended up getting a fellowship at Wheaton Arts, which is a really wonderful, iconic place for glass making. It's actually in Southern New Jersey in the Pine Barrens. And I went there to make these castings and um, I was developing that 
process and like, you know, some glass casting processes, it's kind of like you start from scratch. Like, you know, some things about how a certain process works, but it's like, you're making something weird and experimental and conceptual. So it doesn't really follow the rules of like a material. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I was working on. And then I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't really love like making uh, molds. <laughs> Mold making is really intense and like, Kind of rigid and I just felt like why am I making copies of my own work and other materials and I was like I think glass blowing because I was watching these glass blowers all day long so you're just like in this environment um, and there's other fellows there that are working on things too so during that experience I was like you know I think it's way more improvisational and interesting and, and mirrors the actual process of making the salt for me which is very improvisational so I was like I think these two practices need to come together rather than me like making replicas in like cast lead crystal you know like kind of like you think of your grandmother's like crystal glasses like I was using that mm. material um, mm. but molten yeah which is crazy oh my gosh I want to know more about that grandma's crystal yeah uh, you know the crystal candy dishes and such you know um be careful with that it's crystal I think we've got some crystal glasses that it was like a box I was like we don't need this anymore we were moving and my partner was like uh let me open it up before you decide I'm like don't open it up because we're gonna keep it and of course they're crystal beautiful crystal like cocktail glasses and now we use them on a daily basis because they're just gonna sit there didn't you know there's taking up space so you try to use them yeah but the work that you're making I see there's always that conversation between um you know functional non-functional and I also when you're in the hot shop I can only imagine I mean I don't know a lot of women that work with glass uh I know one other woman that's on art fair uh that did some glass at urban glass in fact um and Allison Kudlow and then I had met a couple other uh gentlemen that that work there but i'm just wondering like what is the ratio are you you know in in the shop and you said around all these fellows so i just thought maybe yeah i mean the team i was working with today was made up of men but there's a lot of women that work in glass actually so um and i think they're really talented too you know so there's there's, there's a lot of women that work both in hot glass and in glass castings so I can't claim to be one of the few. It's I think there's just maybe a maybe a divide between people that really stay in the glass world and then people that um, maybe are working more in like a contemporary art arena with their work in a conceptual way. And I think that's kind of more of like why maybe you don't see as much of that gender representation in like contemporary art glass. Right. Um, I yeah. like the way you're putting that because you're you know pretty much saying the contemporary art in relationship to conceptual development versus potentially that, you know, word that I adore, craft or, yeah. you know, functional work and otherwise, which can conversation can go on with ceramics and fibers and otherwise. But the, um, the works I see behind you, I trust you uh, created those uh, glass pieces. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what's going on in the table there. Yeah, so there's a lot of things happening on this table. I guess we'll talk about the light boxes first. And I will say that- I was going to go to the light boxes. Yeah. Of course, if we were, since we were on the topic of glass. Yeah. If I all... <laughs> so one of the things that I love the most about glass, like as a conceptual material is it's light bearing properties. And I think that's what really drew me to it. Like I come from a background in photography and filmmaking. So for me, I'm always interested in how light, shadow, and dimensionality interact with one another. And I think that's where I got that translation coming from a photographic background and still having a photographic practice, but thinking about sculptures that also like bear light and have a relationship to light. Mm -hmm. um, and so these actually like, I did not make these. These are like, I made these boxes, but basically I'm working with like industrially manufactured sheet glass that's supposed to be cut up and made into like stained glass right so something that you would like solder with lead and turn into like basically more of a collage but i'm using these like manufactured sheets as a conceptual material because i came across them and i was like wow these are really interesting i can't believe that people take these and just like shred them and like make them into these like slumped bowls or whatever you know it just seems so wild to me that they weren't being honored as like what they were which was almost like a painting to me and i was feeling like this painterly quality and thinking about like 
these infusions of two different entities coming together, which is something I work with already mm -hmm. with like the blown glass and salt works. And I was thinking like how nice it is to have something like dripping into another thing. So colors or thinking of like, I was specifically thinking of infusions just like in this moment of COVID and like vaccinations and people having opinions about vaccinations and having those people having fear around something entering into their bloodstream. Um, I don't have those fears and I'm really fascinated by medicine and science. And mm -hmm. so for me, I wanted to like really honor that. And I was like, oh man, I gotta make these into light boxes. So that's the background of like that material. And mm -hmm. in front of that, we have a couple of like glass works as well. So in the center is um, a hot sculpted crystal ball. I was also trying to like imagine like, yeah, like what, 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 what do we know about the future? And I've been also working on making some clouded crystal balls that are like interrupting the idea of like being able to have that vision and really, yeah, mm -hmm. like none of us can see into the future, you know, like we want to think that we have that control, but we don't. Um, a great story about this crystal ball is that I left it in the studio like this and it was on this piece of foam and I show it with like this um, printed silk that's like over the top of the foam. So it's almost like a magnifying glass. Okay. And it didn't occur to me that, you know, when the sun is like coming in the studio at a certain hour, like oh, you are making a glass. So I was just working and I was like, wow, like what's that <laughs> terrible smell? Oh. I was like, huh, where is that coming from? And it was like on fire. The sun just like coming through this crystal ball that was like, had burned a hole into the foam underneath it. It was like burning the silk. So yeah, it's like, it's cool working with volatile things, but they do have this other life that's just beyond you deciding that you're gonna use them as a material. Mm. So there's like rules of physics that also apply to glass. You know, I break glass all the time and it's mm -hmm. terrible and traumatic, but it's part of working with the material. It's just like, it's dangerous in all these like surprise ways. Um, I mean, that's, that's incredibly dangerous. Thank goodness you were present when that was happening and you could have burned the school down. <laughs> yeah, I know, I thought about that. <laughs> I did think about that. I'm really glad that didn't happen. Honestly, what would have happened is the ball would have rolled off of the foam that was holding it in place and it would have smashed on the, because we have to have like concrete floors. So it would just like would have smashed into a million pieces and then like, hopefully the, like the rest of it wouldn't have still been burning, but you know, we have yeah. extensive like, you know, fire safety things here just because there's so many dangerous uh, kind of practices happening and we have like tons of kilns. And of course we have this like big glorious hot shop and you know, so we're a facility that's prepared for those kinds of emergencies, but yeah, nonetheless. Yeah. And so, um, you know, with these light boxes, you're talking about the materials, it's kind of rough glass material and you're placing it. I mean, what, how have you manipulated it at all by just putting a light behind it? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And so you have these like, vibrant indigo hues of these ghost-like smoky, you know, some translucent organic forms and almost in the other with a uh, black background almost seems like it could be an x-ray. Yeah. What, what is that phenomenon? Like what's happening there? It's just the difference between um, the color of the glass and its density or... It's one sheet, it, it's basically two colors. So it is like, think of it as a painting, right? So you just have like a smear of white in the center and then you've got an indigo around it. Um, oh. And I have also made my own sheet glass. Um, it's a kind of a, an interesting process where basically like you ladle, like a huge heavy metal ladle full of glass and you like slop it onto this like hot steel table. And then the table has like a roller that's also steel that's built into it. And then you like crank the roller and flatten the glass. Mm -hmm. um, it's in a, anywhere outside of like a, a commercial manufacturing facility, it's very hard to like get those kinds of colors because they just are able to, it's actually really toxic. Like there's like arsenic and different um, really dangerous oh, yeah. things to create those mm -hmm. colors in glass. Um, but I have worked with like making my own, it's a bit thicker, which is interesting. You just, it's not quite as like, um, like a fine, fine stained glass texture, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's basically two colors and you just can like intermingle them. So you just mm -hmm. like have one smear in the center and then another kind of goes around it. And then you, by rolling it out, it's like the, it's the pressure that's like 
smearing them together. Fascinating. Yeah. And then you are talking, and since we're in your studio right now, and I see this other um, printed silk that's wow. over your right shoulder. So this is a, a similar to what you're talking about, you know, uh, was burning under the, the crystal ball. Yeah. Uh, conceptually, can you talk a little bit about those? It, it's it's a, a photo mechanical print on like organza. Is that what's it's, happening? Um, it's actually on silk habitai. Um, okay. And basically during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time in cemeteries um, where I was like, okay, like let's Thank go for you. a walk where there's not people. Where do people not want to be? They definitely don't want to be in cemeteries. There's too much momentum worry around us all the time during the pandemic. So a lot of people were like, "Not, I, I'm not going to go for a walk in, in the cemetery. But I love cemeteries and I've always been someone like who that. enjoys them. Yes. <laughs> and I kind of like had forgotten about this fascination that I had with them until this experience. And I was like, oh yeah, wow, cemeteries are these beautiful parks that we just ignore because our culture has so many hangups around death and disability and illness and kind of got into this deep research project about the rural garden cemetery and this idea of kind of that the Victorians came up with that was the idea that we could integrate the land of the living and the dead by having this beautiful garden park-like experience where you could go and have like a Sunday picnic amongst the gravestones and like mm. sit in the sun and have a lovely time with your friends. Mm. Um, and I just kind of really connected with that. So I, I did like a kind of an ongoing photo series over the past year where I would just like go out for these like, you know, sometimes daily walks. Like I was there a lot, a lot and was photographing and coming up to Western New York and spending time in some of the rural garden cemeteries that are up here that are so exquisite, that are just have like roads that are made out of like grass and they're all this like lush, lush emerald green and everything is just like, it's like one of the most beautiful parks that you've ever been in with these basic, I mean, I kind of perceive uh, gravestones as sculptures, right? So it's like, you're just surrounded by all these gorgeous stone sculptures and lots of greenery and sometimes flowers. So I was thinking about yeah, what, what it's like to sit with that kind of energy in a moment of a pandemic and just these photographs came out of it. And I was also photographing um, waterfalls as well. So going to these like gorgeous iconic waterfalls which was also part of this idea of the Arcadian landscape that the Victorians were, that wasn't their idea but they kind of took that into account when they were thinking of the cemetery. So these like ideas of like a simplistic kind of return to nature and they're really into like framing things like kind of picture windows. That was their, very much their aesthetic about how a humid would interact with the landscape or with nature. So what this one is, and you get a, a sense of this texture, you know, it's quite light and it's really lovely because I've been working with photographs for so long. And I think one of the things that kind of bores me about photography is like just the rigidity of it. And, you know, it's so the same where it's like, I don't know, I just felt like I needed to be printing on some other material that had more of um, a fluidity to it and was so fascinated by the idea of veils. So I thought like, well, what if I actually like printed the photo on a veil like material, then I could get that effect. So this is um, dappled light on like a mausoleum marble wall in the afternoon. Mm, it's, I mean, it's uh, so highly abstract and unrecognizable when you're speaking of, <laughs> uh, and you know, it's very ghost-like uh, to, to very plainly say uh, the the grayscales as well are 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 really hitting home for me. But knowing that it's coming from a cemetery does give it that ethereal quality, uh, yet not knowing that it's from a cemetery and, and looking at the materials and looking at this kind of light leaking uh, throughout from the center out into the, 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 the square composition or the rectangular composition uh, still kind of does create this elegance and, and this etherealness. Uh, and, and when you present it, I'm seeing that there's a work below oh. it Right, and so um, just based on some of the work that I've seen um, an art fair and, and in different exhibitions that you've had, can you talk a little bit about this series or maybe it would be a good time after uh, you 
address some some of these kind of long-winded questions, maybe we could go into the presentation so we could yeah. see some of the work um, ex in, in an exhibition. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you're correct that this is actually um, a, like the silk is part of a larger artwork. So there, I'm thinking of them as altars. So I'm calling these veil altars. It's also like, I just want to point out, you can't really see this and I don't want to move the, I don't want to make anyone seasick by just moving this camera around. But basically this is also hung on the wall by these mother of pearl um, rectangles. Oh. Right? We've got like these little details too. And some of them have these silver chains that hang around them as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's actually how I got into using the light for the light boxes or the glass for the light boxes. Cause I was thinking of like, yeah, these like energy drains also. And like, like, I love how you say that that leak happens, right? Where you're like mm -hmm. thinking of like how something that's intangible or dematerialized actually has movement or presence, which is kind of like thinking of ghosts in a way, but I think it really expands beyond ghosts too into like more earthen kind of elemental phenomena mm -hmm. and getting kind of back into that dialogue around like the hot shop and like how materials and um, elements flow together to create something that's tangible. So thinking of like these drains and diffusions and veils and things meeting one another and having different textures of like something very concrete and something that's actually has a movement to it was very interesting for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few of them that are like different things where I've actually made the sheet glass. Let's see if I can move this without making you all terribly seasick. You're good. How, you doing? How am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> You're nowhere near. <laughs> good, good. Um, so here's another one. This one does actually have a chain on it. Um, and this is this gorgeous um, like ice formation that I found. It was actually like part of a fountain up near this amazing waterfall that exists here called Letchworth State Park. Highly oh. recommend if you're in Western New York. But anyway, they keep this fountain on all winter and then it creates these like gorgeous long dripping phenomena. And then at the bottom here, this is um, a piece of sheet glass that I made. Now we're getting to like the outer limits of like what this computer can do. Um, but you can see that there's like an archway here. This blue actually fades into a clear. And this is a glass that my very good friend, Henry Jackson Speaker developed, which is actually a neodymium glass that color shifts. So basically depending on the kind of light that you're looking at this in, it's either like this kind of like, I don't know, almost periwinkle blue or it shifts in sunlight to be a little bit more green, which is really an incredible experience. So you get this sense of like that glass actually changing as well. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a whole, there's, there's many more of these and I've just been really enjoying working with like the idea of an altar in a way that feels a little bit more approachable than like how you might think of a traditional ritual altar that's very much like architecturally keeps you away from it. Like there's this kind of dimensionality in space, right? I think of like a, like a Catholic church, it's like, it's kind of like a big table, right? And like you can't go around it and like, you can't go really go around these either, but like you can get so, so close to them and you can really have an experience and thinking about honoring like what it feels like to be in the presence of these like material dematerial phenomena basically and like what does it feel like to be in the presence of the ephemeral mm -hmm. and the chains and the pearls seem i mean they seem consistent with your work in relationship to using um natural materials combined with you know un unsuspecting other materials yet the pearl or the chain they have this kind of uh, luxury or jewelry type of adornment and i'm i guess i'm thinking is that its purpose or did you have some other idea in mind when you know choosing pearl like tacks or this what seems like a silver chain yeah it does have that quality to it i i really felt like it needed like when you're thinking of like mortality and the ephemeral like it just needed a little bit of like something else to like that was decorative that said like this is something that's more than just like images on top of one another like this is like a holy kind of sacred space that's like delineated it's also thinking of like the chains that you see in graveyards where they're like on the ground they're like very close to the ground they're like on those little posts that are maybe like a foot and a half two feet high and they're just like they almost like mark off this invisible space that like 
it's almost ridiculous that they're there. They're so small and they, they seem so decorative. And you're like, okay, like <laughs> this is here. We love that. Um, so I wanted to reference that, but in a way that felt like really precious and lovely. And like, I don't know, I also just get into like some real fetishy material realms where I just like, I felt like being a fetishist about it where I was like, yeah, let's have some like silver chain. Like I looked at so many different chains trying to understand like what would be the right chain for this? And like, so many of them just felt enormous and like the presence of chain can mean so many different things. And it is just like, it's a thing that is in contemporary art right now too. The people like love working with chain, right? And I didn't want to overpower the subtlety of the image or the materials that I'm working with by having some like huge honking thing that was hanging off of it. Um, so I went for this like more delicate kind of jewelry style situation. But Mother of Pearl too really kind of has that like Victorian death ritual feel to it for me as well and it has that kind of old world quality and it's like of the earth something that isn't I, it felt like it couldn't be plastic or it couldn't be too industrial looking so yeah mm -hmm. have you explored other materials with these works uh besides the chain and the pearls do they are are, are they coming with um consistent extras like this or are they you know are each one of them kind of their own um they have their own accoutrements I guess you would yeah they I, they all kind of have their own accoutrement in a way like some of them have chains some of them don't like some of them have these like cast glass prisms that like sit at the bottom of the altar mm. um they all just have like their own little unique thing. So I have played around a little bit. Mostly it's been like tweaking to see like what specific chain looks good. Gotcha. Um, I, there was a period where I was working with like live plants. Like I did this installation in Newburgh that was like a dune. And so part of me thinks that a nice other direction that these could go in would be to like also have, yeah, some kind of like live flower plant situation that interacted mm. with them. That might be a little bit too in the like mourning grief department. So I guess that's why I haven't really fully gone there, but um, just materially, it's, it seems nice. So I don't know, I'll, I'll keep you posted. Yeah, I, I rather like the idea of the, the plant life because you immediately need to make a decision for the longevity of the piece. Is this uh, meant to be replenished? Is it meant to be cared for or is it meant to die? Yeah. Right. And um, I know that an artist named Cheryl Pope, we showed once that had this beautiful funerary work that uh, was made out of carnations. And um, when I was producing it, you know, it, was, it smelled so good. It was so lively and, was just, you know, it spelled out too young to die. But ultimately the intention was for every single one of those carnations to die and to watch them slowly die. Mm. And, you know, I suppose it just, you know, referential for you, like, I think there's certainly other artists that work with plants, Rashi Johnson, uh, yeah. you know, um, you know, certainly more than we can even, uh, uh, let's focus on you, right? But, you know, understanding, understanding that, um, that idea, you know, it, com it comes, it's really heavy, and it comes with a lot of forethought. Yeah, and I love that. I love the idea of like having care be integrated into like the living presence of an artwork in a way that almost becomes performative and interactive where like you really do have to be engaging with something and thinking about it as a living being. And I, and I think that was what was so lovely for me doing with that Dune installation is I really was like a caretaker for mm -hmm. these living beings. And it was about like, okay, like I'm not just like telling these plants what to do. Like I have to actually be listening and collaborative in my own way. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, but we'll see what, I've also been just like photographing plants and thinking of maybe like the photographs on silk are of plants. So it isn't necessarily like just existing as like a live thing. So even here, See if I can show you here. And we've got like, so this yeah. is like palm, you know, kind of like an Easter Sunday palm. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see it as having um, Christian significance. I just really love this gorgeous long green experience that reminded me so much of these other smears and drains that were happening. So I just brought this into um, the 
this little tiny waterfall that we have around here and was photographing it from above. So anyway, yeah. Mm, and that's just like a quick shutter speed to get that ripply water gotcha. and uh, just natural daylight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, what are you printing as inkjet prints or it looks like it's on a matte paper. Yeah, that one's on a matte paper. That's really a test print, but um, there's, there's silks of that too that are like quite a bit larger that are ah. like 24 by 30. Um, and you know, the silks are really complicated to print on too. It's like, it's yeah. so, so, so fine. So yeah. it's like learning how to deal with that finicky, fussy material, like everything, all these materials are so fussy, like glass is so fussy, like the salt is so fussy, like the silk is so fussy. So just like, <laughs> learning well, to my, have, like delicate patience with all of them. Of course. I mean, especially the silk because it can ripple and you lose it, you know, you keep you get slivers or whatever they're called. Oh yeah, there's it's always so like these little frayed hems. Mm -hmm. But what are you, so then you're, you're not, you know, calling these in, you're basically, are you using emulsion and in creating photo screens or, or are you, are you printing them on uh, an electronic printer? What, what's your process? You're, you're putting the, the, the silk in the printer? Yeah. Yeah. So there's actually a silk that comes like on a roll and it has a backing to it and it goes through an inkjet oh. printer. So it's specifically for inkjet prints. Like you can't just okay. run silk through a printer that would like destroy your printer. I don't even think it probably doesn't even go through, honestly. Um, <laughs> because it needs something rigid underneath it so that it can actually print. And then once you've printed it, like I let it dry for a period of time so that like there's not too much moisture happening. And then sure. you peel the backing away, which is really complicated too, because then like you know, this like very fine silk just wants to like distort into some other weird shape that's no longer a rectangle and then that distorts your image. Um, and I usually like to work with those kinds of material challenges, but in some ways, sometimes I'm like, no, this really needs to be a rectangle. <laughs> I really yeah. need to work with the image as I have anticipated it. Um, so that's always like- Going well, steady. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, definitely a test of time. Well, let's, um, let's get to this uh, little bit of inspo and uh, slides that you've prepared today so we can see, uh, although it's so fantastic to be in your studio, uh, I want to see some of these works uh, in an exhibition space. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so everybody, like, hold tight. I am not the Zoom priestess that I should be at this stage of my Zoom life, but we're going to see what we can make happen here. <laughs> and you're probably going to see my totally cluttered desktop so please bear with me thank you, you, for your you, patience. you can help it just go down that little green button share screen go <laughs> okay hey how we doing <laughs> I like the grid with the grid <laughs> <laughs> you know i haven't found like a i'm sure there's a way to do this i just haven't found like the tidy way to like show everything um, okay, so full screen. Um, <laughs> wow, I should have done this beforehand. Do you want to? Okay, do you want to start with slide five or are you starting with? I'm just trying to get us to a full screen. Okay, just play sure. slide five, school. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so. Hi, we all know who I am, Whoa. just in case, just to check in, Molly McKinley. Um, so I, I thought it'd be really nice to um, start out actually with some questions, because I think that's like one of the most important things about my practice, right, is I have this super non-monogamous approach to material, and it's really about like what material needs to like fit with these questions that I'm working through, right? So there's an evolving series of these that are happening in my practice all the time. And they kind of balance between poetic and philosophical. And I'm just gonna touch on a few that are happening right now. Um, relationships are alchemical. What happens when two separate entities or two binaries, so that can be two different binary ideas, begin to dissolve into a third liminal thing. And so this is one of the sculptures from my series that was really exploring that idea, which is that sculpture series is called Salt Cradle which is blown glass and uh, water carved salt. 
how can humans learn to sit with the discomfort of the unknown? And can the unknown be pleasurable? Like, I really am so interested in figuring out like, I don't know, everyone's like so freaked out about things like mystery and death and like unknowing. And I just feel like, what if they're kind of sexy, wonderful, pleasurable, delicious experiences? Like why, why have we disconnected from those ideas so much in our culture and devalued them? And like, there are so many luscious aspects to them. And I just am not convinced that uh, they're not pleasurable actually. That's a really wonderful point. I love it. And it's so, uh, I mean, I suppose I would say it's more like a year ago, but it, what we went through, through the pandemic and the um, COVID-19 and like not knowing and unknowing, I didn't know what was happening tomorrow. Didn't know when the vaccine was going to be done. Didn't know anything yet to be able to live in the present and be prepared to, you know, some of the things were actually quite enjoyable. I mean, despite the death and, you know, some of the uncovering of, um, thankfully some of the institutional, you know, just uh, marginalizations and racism that was happening and, and you know, it continues, but it's, it, it's, it, it was kind of that, what's the silver lining here? I don't know anything and I can't pretend to know anything, but I'm gonna move forward and I'm just gonna say, you know what? I really enjoy not going out to dinner and saving money <laughs> or like, Hey, I'm really enjoying, uh, you know, the way things are changing in the art world and, and, and honestly how they are kind of consistent and, you know, we're kind of going back to normal, but it's forever going to be a new adventure, uh, in relationship to that. And so I do think that that adventure of the unknown is very pleasurable. Yeah. Um, I, I am a little bit of a glass half full kind of person. Uh, yeah, but that's just how, um, anyway, this question is just, it's, it's so, it's so pertinent yeah. right now. And I think within the work and understanding death. For right? sure. And like, there's certain, I just want to say, of course, there's like, there's these structural aspects to living in like a white supremacist, sexist, like capitalist structure that makes death hell, right? Like it is like, there are these structures that have made death really a terrible experience for a lot of people and have made America kind of into like a death cult too. And I think maybe what I'm more talking about is like these moments of being like, looking at the dappled light on the mausoleum wall and really like allowing ourselves to be like, there's something that's like profoundly intelligent about that. There's like a wisdom and that there's like, I don't know, it kind of gets into contemplative practice too. Like I'm very interested in like um, spiritual traditions that work with the contemplative and sit in silence and mm -hmm. bring knowledge from silence and unknowing and see that as valuable rather than like, just like time that you're not doing anything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a really important, um, series of questions for me around mm -hmm. pleasure and the unknown, mm -hmm. um, which kind of leads us to this idea of like, mm, like maybe we can learn to communicate with the unknown. And what would that feel like to be communicating with something that's ethereal, elemental, beyond the idea of human intelligence, getting into the intelligence of other life forms or things that we presume as lifeless. Like there's this kind of obviously like widespread idea that things like rocks are just dead, right? Like they're not sentient, they don't have an intelligence, they don't carry wisdom to them, but I actually don't agree with that at all. And I think that they do have like an inherent um, like history obviously within them that's like part of the geological record, but I think there's something deeper in that. Um, and light too, you know, thinking of like how much I work with light and like what is the intelligence of light and how do you communicate with that? And like, if you can communicate with it, like what is it saying to you? I don't know. TBD. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of conversations around that right now in relationship to like uh, intelligent beings, whether our future selves in the quantum or whether it's, you know, the close encounters of the, what is it, I think it's the fifth kind when you actually come in contact through um, your own cosmic intelligence. And, and call that to you or the paranormal can you speak to the paranormal <laughs> there's certainly I mean to you know the, the the astral plane and otherwise and I think that those are great great questions yet there I'm I'm certain you've researched the fact that so many think yes we can 
Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm also like not a new age person, ironically. Like it yeah. seems like I would definitely be in that direction, but I'm so science oriented that I'm like, science is going to show us one day, like what rocks have to talk to us about. Um, and I'm just very interested in like the connection between like the very ancient past and the future. And I think there is an intersection there that kind of is what you're talking about. Um, and that brings us to this side of just looking mm -hmm. at how ancient cultures used stone, you know, like we, of course we see stone ruins because that's like the one thing that has survived over time, right? There's other materials too, like glass that also exists in the geological record and has a geological time scale to it. Um, but I was really thinking a lot about like ancient sites and the stone that is part of like a ritual experience and part of like a performative experience. Mm -hmm. um, and also just looking at all these gorgeous natural phenomena um, that have an erosion to them and speak to time. And I think time is another kind of thing that we haven't really directly spoken about in this conversation, but is so important in my work as well. Um, I've been very influenced by Druidic and Celtic practices as well at, which is on the left here, we've got this like Druid priest. Um, he's got like this amazing snake drinking milk out of a little dish below him. And I've also been studying hermetic alchemy for like the past, mm. like maybe like 13 years, I would say. Wow. So on the right, we just have um, a manuscript page that illuminates some ideas around glass as it relates to alchemy. And I've been studying the ancient um, Alexandrian origins of some of like the classic designs for alchemical glassware that were used in laboratory alchemy. So very interested in these ideas of like, yeah, like how do objects kind of exist as ritual objects and like performative practice. And um, I have done like videos and photographs and series where like I am activating some of these objects in a more tangible way rather than just having them on a table or a plinth. Like that's not always the most interesting direction for me. I really want an object to feel like it has an activation and it has a life that's just beyond um, stasis actually. Um, Would you would you then consider your viewer engaging or having any kind of like touch therapy with the work? That's a really interesting question. Um, there's, <laughs> the, the materials themselves are so uh, fragile that it's really, it's hard to go there, but <laughs> yeah. uh, people definitely want to touch them for sure. Um, and I have had people touch them when they're not supposed to. Um, but I think it would be cool. Like I have considered that before and just never kind of gone there, but the salt in particular has this like strange, um, interplay. Like sometimes it really goes in this direction where it feels quite waxy and then other times it's more granular. Um, so it kind of goes back and forth between feeling like salt and feeling like stone. Um, and it has mm -hmm. a relationship with moisture. That's quite interesting too, where it like pulls in moisture mm -hmm. from the environment and then releases it back out of its body. So I think of it as like a weeping or crying out of the salt body. And salt is um, a material that I got into also because I was interested in uh, the hermetic principle of salt and al alchemy, which is about the body engaged in ritual. So there is this um, very literal tie-in between like studying alchemical practices um, of the Western tradition. And I will say that there's a lot of non-Western alchemical traditions that are incredible. Like Islamic alchemy is incredibly important and they were actually making more advanced alchemical glassware much earlier than the Europeans were. Um, so yeah, let's see. Just having a little technical glitch. This is not, this like slideshow is like not responding. Oh, here we go. Um, I wanted to show you a photograph of a fumarole. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced one of these, but um, this is a geothermal experience. This is sulfur actually. So this is coming up from the earth and it has that same quality to it as some of the salt sculptures where you have this like very organic clumping mass and you have holes where like something is coming in and going back out, you know. So I just am so fascinated by looking at the natural world around us and pulling from that and bringing that directly into the practice. Here's another one. I mean, they're just so gorgeous. I think this one is in Russia. Um, I think the other one might've been from uh, Iceland, I believe, where there's also a lot of geothermal activity, as we know. Have you been to Yellowstone? Oh yeah, I've been to Yellowstone uh, a bunch of times, actually. I used oh. to live in Colorado and I spent a lot of time in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
spending time out west and I, I've done work in Joshua Tree as well and looking mm. at like large western landscapes has been um, pretty formative for me. Mm. So just for those of you who are maybe not super familiar with these sculpt sculptures that I've been working on, these were some of the first that I made. Um, this was shown in exhibition at Pioneer Works in 2017. And these are first like brought down from a block, again, like working with industrial material um, and taking this block of salt that's 50 pounds. It's meant for horses and cattle as a nutritional supplement and using a hammer and chisel and creating geometric patterns within that and then using a power washer to water carve the rest of this salt. And so you get this idea of like, it looks like something that like is from nature or is like, has this, I don't know. Some people think they have this like creature-like presence to them. I don't really see that as much, but um, this other thing comes out of the salt, which is really nice. Um, mm -hmm. I try to gear up, you know, This I knew I was being photographed, so I'm not wearing like any eye protection or respirator, but you get the idea of like working on a table, a hammer and chisel, and then you've got this, you, I mean, you, you get like sopping wet. So I have to wear some kind of um, rain gear to do it. That's a really lovely picture. Yeah, thank you. This is um, at Wheaton Arts, which is where I started working with this blown glass and salt series. Mm. Here's another one. So again, like, salt is really temperamental in this format and so so many of the works that i make like just completely collapse right before i think that they're done and it just happens over and over and over and over again and so i started thinking to myself that maybe there was something about the fragment that, that was really important that i was ignoring and that actually the fragmentation was maybe no more of like a an a, a truth than this fantasy of like the whole perfect thing and trying to like evade this like really toxic mythology of perfection and being like, okay, like I think that these fragments need to support one another and be in conversation with one another in a different way. So I started working with those as well. And this, these are just literally um, supporting each other with their own weight. Like there's no kind of adhesive or binding thing that's happening to keep them together. These works then, um, <laughs> another one of these logistical registrarial questions, I'm just wondering like, cataloging something like this or buying something like this, uh, how steadfast are they? Are they, how do you make them archival or do you? Such a fascinating question. I talk about this all the time. People love to ask me this question and there's a lot of different answers to it. Um, my first answer when I'm feeling a little like cagey, you know, I'm like, yes. you know what? You wouldn't put a painting outside. Don't put this outside. Don't put it in your bathtub. Um, my more elaborate response is that actually once these dry out, they have this almost ceramic like quality to them where like you can tap on them, they mm -hmm. almost sound hollow. And mm -hmm. salt is in itself a preservative, right? So like it's, sure. it kind of is, it's cured itself um, with the exception of putting it in an extremely humid room, right? So they wanna be in conditions that are dry. They don't really wanna be like on your beach house with all the windows open. And if they are, like, they'll still be okay, but something that will happen is that, again, they are pulling the moisture from the environment and weeping them out. So, like, they'll just be, like, some beads of, like, salty water that, like, drip down the plant, right? So that's something that might happen if you don't take care of it in an archival way. Right. And, and I mean, certainly dust it and things, because I can imagine that it could get quite, quite dirty. They do get a little dirty. Yeah, I actually, I met with a conservator, um, who works in museums to talk to her about the how how to think of these in an archival way and how to work with them. Um, and there's lots of different ways to clean them. You know, like compressed canned air is a is a great solution. I mean, if for some reason they're in an extremely dusty room, like sometimes I'll take like a little bit of like white plasticine and kind of like almost like a lint roller and like pick up any little bits of dust that fall on there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question, you know. I'm, I have pieces of salt from this series that are, that were made in like 2013 and they're doing great, so. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, S.P. Harper emphasizes that there's such a gorgeous contrast between the sculpture and the base. And that pedestal really is fantastic with that crack and the color. Uh, where are you sourcing that? And are you, is that found or are you, I actually had, so this is pine and I had them um, cut for me at a mill in okay. the Hudson Valley up in Ghent, um, where I just decided that I really love to have them 
almost like a body, right? So it's like, again, bringing this back to the idea of the alchemical salt body and giving it some stature. So like you approach these and you feel like, okay, like I'm coming, I'm coming towards another body, right? It's not like on, I like them on a table too. Like that is a nice energy, but I love the idea of like a body meeting a body. And if that's, of course, like, I don't want to get into ableist language. That is if you're standing, if you're in a wheelchair, like there's also in the back, you can see there's something that is like a little bit lower. So I want to be able to have accessibility for different viewpoints as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I just had these milled basically. They were like cut, it was actually cut from one huge tree. Fantastic. Phenomenal. And this is uh, just an installation photograph from the um, Pioneer Works show that I referenced. And the other part of this obviously is that there's photographs in this show of um, ritual performances in landscapes such as Joshua Tree and um, some on the East Coast as well. But thinking about that landscape coming in and out of a sculptural and photographic performative experience. Mm -hmm. um, so this was one of the first castings I did. This is actually glass. So um, it looks like salt, but I had created this process of using um, powder glass to create many, many, many millions of bubbles that foam up and create like this very salt-like experience. And this is on a piece of Carrera marble. Mm. Um, so this is a lead crystal that I was talking about. Um, so the lead creates this beautiful light refraction and allows you to really get a sense of this glow, which you don't always get with other kinds of glass, like a soda lime or a borosilicate. Mm. And then recently I was like, oh, they're candelabras. I'm gonna put candles in them. <laughs> Just like thinking of different things to like do with these holes in the salt where it's like, I suddenly felt like the holes needed to be repaired and that they were so, like, there is this kind of violence or injury that feels like part of the process when you're like blasting these holes into salt. And I was like, I don't know, like, how do we like, how do we care for it in a different way? Like bring, how do we like bring light down into that body? So thinking of like the light body and salt interacting together. There's another one of those. Yeah, the, the, the work that, you know, the, um, the lead, the green lead, the candles, these works, you also document these works and sell them as prints, correct? Yeah, some of them, yeah. So only some of them. Do you have like rhyme or reason as to which ones you choose to document for sale as a print or um, and then, you know, versus kind of the, the, the actual acquisition of these as each unique original pieces? Mm. Yeah, like most of them are not prints. Like there's, there's just a few that I've made into prints because like in, they photograph in a specific way that like pushes them into another territory, like beyond documentation. Yeah. Um, if it really feels like sculpture documentation, like I'm probably not gonna sell that photograph. Um, <laughs> But if it feels like the light has like brought the sculpture to life in a specific way, in a way that's interesting to me, then yes. Also there was just, there was demand for the prints. And so I was like, okay, like that's a cool way for someone who like maybe isn't ready to be like owning a sculpture, like can still have a relationship with this artwork. And so that felt like a nice experience to provide for somebody who like really wants to meditate on that image and think about those materials together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to show you also like what it looks like when you're casting these like lead crystal things. So this is like a kiln that's at like 1750 degrees and you've got these molds that are like melting glass into them. It's wild. Oh, wow. Um, so here we come back to this idea of blown glass and this is about 19 inches long. So it's like quite large. And just having like this very, very heavy piece of salt being buoyed up onto this pillow of like hollow blown glass, which has been just like such a seductive project to work on. This is what I was working on earlier today in the hot shop, making new sculptures um, from new salt and thinking of like different ways to configure these shapes that are underneath. Um, one of the things that happens that's really lovely is you get burn marks on the salt um, I've also been working through like the toxicity of that because like, of course, you know anything about science and salt, like, you know, when you burn salt, you create um, chlorine gas, which is terrible. So, you know, there are a lot of volatile parts to this process, but then they kind of create this like incredible artifact that's like, I think quite poetic. 
um, that really shows like this moment of relationship between two things and like that idea of like meeting something and being forever changed by it and creating this third entity from that experience. You really see that in this one too, which is like deeply, deeply burned and um, actually has this like kind of alabaster white color that's fading up into clear to give this illusion of like smoke being present in this scenario as well. Mm -hmm. This is um, a brand new one, um, which I believe is going to be shown um, at Fridman Gallery and they have a new oh, location yeah. in Beacon, New York. This is my plug. Everyone ready for my plug? This is my PR. Yeah, well, I was going to ask yeah, if we got five know. minutes, you got to fit it in there. <laughs> Um, yeah, so July 3rd, um, I will be showing some new salt and glass sculptures at Fridman Gallery, along with some new sheet glass and neon. So come check it out. It'll be up for a month. Very exciting. And that's just another view of it. Yeah, do we have five minutes? Is that where we're at? Yeah, we're, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, this could be a cool time for us to, like, see if there's questions or, True. you know, or I could just, like, keep going. Yeah, keep going. I mean, throw them, going. You know, folks can throw them in the chat. Yeah, throw and, it in the chat. No. Um, so I was also thinking like, well, I don't know, like, why does, why does the salt have to be part of it at all? Maybe it's, that's just like, it was kind of a ghost impression, then it's gone, you know, bringing us always back to ghosts. Um, and I, again, thinking like, well, how do I activate this object other than just like having it in a gallery? So I brought this, like, I call this a milky egg, you know, it's pretty big. It's like, it'd be like 14 inches long. So mm. bringing this milky egg into different Hudson Valley landscapes and photographing it. Um, these are photographs, so I do sell these. I know back to that question, you know, because it really is something other than like sculpture documentation. Like it's mm -hmm. the thing having an experience in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't not put this in there. So this is um, to give you an idea of what the process is like. Um, we have like a glass blower who has this large um, egg shape that I, you know, have kind of directed them to like create a certain form and putting it on top of this table and pressing the salt into that, well, it's like quite, quite, quite hot. And it's really only a couple of seconds that this transpires. Like I I've, I've, have experimented with even just today of like dragging that process out a little bit. So it's, I have a little bit longer to like finesse the salt in, but mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it's only screaming hot for a very short period of time. Right. Um, and then, you know, bringing it back to this idea of the pastoral and the garden cemetery. Um, just thinking of like this project I've been working on with the sheet glass and printed silk. So this is the Mount Auburn Garden Cemetery. This is in Cambridge. It's like one of the most beautiful places. If, if you ever get a chance to go, I highly recommend. Um, and these Arcadias really influenced my work uh, in, in this series, partly because I'm like in a very rural place where there's just like not a lot happening other than the landscape and it has a lot of pastoral qualities to it so I was like huh okay I guess I guess we're working with like the pastoral here um and so going to these huge waterfalls which are very classically Arcadian and this is in the dead of winter like ice that's melting and breaking off into like these huge 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 holes in the earth which like felt to me like these basically templates of like, uh, you know, the holes in the salt, but like quite haunting. Like this is probably like, I don't know, like maybe not a two story building, but it's, it, it's, this is a, the scale is not really communicated here um, mm -hmm. on purpose, but it's, it's quite uh, monumental. And just thinking of like those other monuments, right? Like what's a monument that's made out of the earth versus like a monument to our mortality. And like, why do we make these monuments to mortality? Why are we carving marble and placing them in piles on the earth? Like it just kind of is confounding to me. And so it's working on that through um, these photographs. And I ended up making a book out of this too. It's called Summer Goth. I'm gonna do a performance of it in Newburgh <laughs> soon. It, the, the summer goth comes to the summer, which is, it, they're all like winter photographs, which is funny, but um, I'll be doing a, an experimental reading and performance at the Ann Street Gallery um, the, uh, the first, no, the second weekend in, uh, in July. So um, if you, can, cool. you can follow me on Instagram and I'll tell you all about it. That's my other plug. <laughs> So I'll just close with this one too. So there's like some just theoretical questions that I'm like thinking about with like 
this project summer goth and like the veil altars and um yeah i think that's maybe the key to thinking about like understanding my practice and what i hope that some of you will get today of after this lecture that you've been so generous with your time to come in and hear us today but um that's yeah it's really just a, a question driven practice and using materials in a really um yeah non-monogamous way to understand how that some of those relationships and questions unfold um yeah is there internal pressure under the earth's crust from all the things made by men did the earth consent to bear that weight i don't know it feels mm. a little non-consensual to me no, did the earth consent to fracking which will make things fall into the earth i don't know the crust um i know yeah these questions are are really fantastic and can you imagine tenderly your remaining body material gesture minerality moving in and out of the landscape i can absolutely I know. Um, I wish I could just give you a big astral hug right now and 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 show you that my new age ass really loves <laughs> questions. <laughs> Molly, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you so much for going so deep. Oh yeah. The, uh, practice and being able to see some of the works. Um, Michelle Sokolov says, these are wonderful selections from your body of creation. So great to see and experience your great work. Congratulations. Congratulations on your show in Beacon, uh, other future projects, um, Ann Street and otherwise. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you again. Yeah, and um, yeah, and, and take it easy over there in uh, West State of New York. Thank you. And thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate your time. I know we're like really over Zoom at this point. So it means a lot that you were here today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For me too. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here, and I'll uh, see you soon, Molly. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Carolina. Bye. Bye.